Whether you're trying to make a SaaS just for financial freedom or you're trying to start a unicorn startup, these tips will apply universally. Here are seven things that I would have paid $100,000 probably to know four years ago because they would have saved me so much time. And these are the mistakes I made while running my last business, which is called rib.gg. For reference, I spent four years building a analytics platform for a popular esport called Valorant with a partner. And we ended up getting over 500,000 page views on average per month at this point. And we have a bunch of teams still signed up to our SaaS. So this business, even though we're not actively working on it, it is still bringing in page views and it's still bringing in monthly reoccurring revenue. And yeah, here are the seven biggest lessons I learned and mistakes that I would not repeat while starting my new startup, which is called Panda. The first biggest mistake is not knowing whether you want to build it using a no code tool like Bubble or Webflow, or if you want to build it using custom code. Nowadays, if you're not familiar, a lot of SaaS applications, if it's simple enough and it's not super custom, can actually just be built on top of something like Webflow or Bubble.io. They allow API integrations and stuff. But if you start building on one and then try to move to the other, it will take up a ton of time. And that's what happened to us. We didn't start with Bubble or Webflow, but we did start off as a new site that was built on top of WordPress. And we had maybe 300 articles on WordPress within our first couple of months before we decided to build a custom website. And we had to pretty much, because we didn't want to migrate all those articles over, stick with WordPress on the back end for the articles on the site. And WordPress was just hell to work with. I wish we just chose a headless CMS to from the beginning if we knew that we were starting a code-based site instead of a no-code site. And that's a decision you guys are going to have to make depending on what your use cases are. Generally, I'd say if you're not building something that's extremely complex on the coding side, you could probably get away with using Bubble, especially if you're doing something like a GPT wrapper or something that's AI and just has a couple of moving parts that revolve around APIs, calling other APIs and storing basic data. Additionally, if you're able to get a working prototype faster using a no code tool than a coding tool, I'd highly recommend doing that because it is so important to validate your idea and you don't want to spend all this time custom coding a tool that might take two to three months to code when you could have built an MVP off of it on a tool like Webflow and seen whether or not users are even interested in the idea itself. Number two, you should either be building or talking to customers slash selling when you first start your business. There are so many things that can be considered a waste of time when you start things like caring about legal, caring about marketing, caring about the name and the logo and the look and aesthetic of the company. There's a great video from YC on um, why you are pretty much wasting time if you're thinking about anything other than building or selling. And I have it linked in my mind map so you can go and watch that video if you want. But essentially anything that is not related to either building the MVP of your product or selling a customer slash talking to them to try and understand whether or not your MVP solves a problem is going to be wasting your time. The whole whole point of an early stage startup is to come up with a theory of a problem that you can solve and test two things by building and talking to people. You're testing number one, whether it's actually a real problem that is worth solving. And number two, whether or not your solution actually solves it. And the only way to validate those two things is by actively going and talking to people once you have built a very simple MVP to validate whether the problem exists and whether or not that your solution actually solves it. At the beginning of my startup, we didn't have a problem for a couple of years. We were just trying to put out things like, oh, maybe people would like this, or maybe people would find this feature cool. I think this feature is cool, so maybe they will too. And that is the complete wrong way to approach things. Number three, and this is probably the most personal to me because I got burnt pretty badly by this, is choose your industry very, very wisely depending on your goals. I learned the hard way that you can build something that is very hard to build, but if its market is very small, it doesn't matter how hard it was to build or how impressive it is, it's not going to net you a lot of money in the long term if the market is tiny. My goal with our esports site wasn't to build some billion dollar business, but it was to build something that we could eventually sell four years down the line and walk away with a substantial amount of money. However, our primary customers are tier one and tier two Valorant teams. Guess what? There's only around a hundred of those teams in the entire scene. So if we're charging a maximum of $99 a month and we have all 100 of those teams, the most we're going to be making is $10,000 per month, which puts a pretty big cap on how much our company can be worth in total. And to really drive this point in, there is a game called RuneScape that a lot of you might have heard of. And RuneScape has some client called RuneLight, which allows you to run the game. And people can make plugins or applications
applications on top of RuneLight to help players in the game. And some of these applications are so complicated because of the way the game works, and they're so complex, and I can imagine it must have taken people months in order to code, but because they're coding something very hard for a video game, it actually nets them almost no money at all. And I can speak from experience, the code base we put together for our esports startup is probably far more complex than most SaaS companies that have almost $10 million in ARR at this point and have gotten investing. So make sure you're smart when you are building something. The difficulty of what you are building is not correlated to the reward and the total possible ceiling of what you can achieve while doing so. And that leads me to the fourth thing, which is a saying called, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with someone else, pretty much. One of the most important things I did while starting this company was I chose a co-founder who's somebody that I respect as a programmer, and I've worked with him previously, and we had a lot of synergy, and I would not have been able to put together nearly as great of a product without my co-founder, and I'm sure it's vice versa for him as well. So I highly recommend building with someone else. Even though it might be faster to do things yourself, and I firsthand experienced that, you can go a lot farther when you have someone there to support you while you're building, but also to support each each other while things aren't looking good. When one person is sort of low on conviction on the idea, chances are the other person might be high on conviction and you can sort of motivate yourself through these sort of rough periods. Number five is be attached to the problem, not your solution. I can't tell you the amount of times I try to shoehorn a solution for this business using something like AI when nobody was asking for it. I spent three months when ChatGPT came out working on something I called ValGPT, which would answer anyone's questions just like ChatGPT would, except it would be about Valorant. And what I quickly realized was that even though there was this great new technology of AI, nobody really had a problem that AI could solve. And I just kept trying to take AI and shoehorn it into every single possible avenue I could. And there are even other features that I try to code, like for example, this free agents table. And I essentially made this because I'm like, well, we know who's not on a team currently and might be looking for a team so I can create this idea. And I quickly learned that nobody really asked for this and nobody had a problem of finding free agents. So me spending three weeks trying to put this together was not actually the best decision. You should be in love with the actual problem that your users have and trying to find solutions that can fix it and not be trying to match solutions to random problems that you think might exist. This seems simple and it seems like there's not much of a difference, but it is one of the most important things you can do. For Pandem, we know that there is a ton of issues with on-call when it comes to actual engineers on the job. And we don't know if our initial product actually solves those problems yet, but the point is, the problem is sort of the golden opportunity that you can really build a business out of, not necessarily the solution. So we are pretty much talking to engineers and trying to see, does this actually solve this big problem that you have? If not, no problem, we can code something else and keep trying until we find a solution. And that is the process known as finding product market fit. Now, before I get to the biggest thing, which is number seven, let's talk about number six, which is getting SEO done properly and in the beginning, but not too early. SEO is gonna be one of those things that's not really useful for the majority of businesses, especially if you're B2B, but if you are B2C, you want to get that set up, not too early, but eventually. For my site, Run It Back, even though most of our revenue comes in from B2B, selling to other teams. We have a ton of page views a month that helps with advertising here and there. But because we cover so many series, we have over 300 thousand pages that are indexed on Google. And we didn't start paying attention to SEO until literally like a year and a half ago. If we did, we could have had so many more page views just by the nature of actual pages we have on the site. Now, remember what I said, if you're not building or talking to customers, you're probably wasting time. So I wouldn't do this immediately. But if you are B2C and you think the primary way of people discovering you is going to be on Google, I'd recommend getting those things figured out, not to like a hardcore degree, but maybe spending like a couple of days just making sure all your pages are up to date with the latest SEO standards. A lot of people have been waiting for me to create a video or something in my mind map about SEO, which I'll probably eventually do, but I would highly recommend just looking at the Ahrefs YouTube channel. This is where I learned everything. I use their tool and stuff like that, and it's not that complicated once you sort of go through a couple of their videos, so I'd recommend starting there. And by the way, if you're interested in the number side of how much page views and traffic and money that page views actually bring in, I do have a video on my channel talking about exactly that. So it's the last video right before this one. And finally, number seven, which would have saved me so much time is learning from the right sources. I can't tell you how many people there are on Instagram or YouTube talking about growing businesses who have never started a business in their lives 
other than talking about how to start a business. And when I first started, I sort of tried to just get a bunch of data from a ton of different sources, but I quickly learned the number one source is by far, if you're trying to start a startup, a business, a SaaS, why Combinator? I have watched almost every single video they have put out in the last like three years alone, and I have learned more from running a startup and a business from them than anywhere else. And it's not like these guys are just naturally good at doing it or anything. They literally have seen over 10,000 companies companies go through their program. So they have the data to be able to see what works and what doesn't empirically. It is not anecdotal evidence like, for example, what I just talked about in this video. It is purely based on data that they have seen across a wide number of companies. And that is probably the best data in the world that exists on how to create a successful business. You'll note that I have a mind map on how to run a startup and I'm constantly updating it with notes. And all of these steps, pretty much every single source for all of these, like for example, launching and building an MVP and how to get your first 10 customers, all of these are just me taking a ton of notes from Y Combinator, and I'm linking the source for every piece of data for all of this. So I highly recommend checking that out if you don't wanna spend the 80 plus hours that I have personally spent watching Y Combinator videos. You can see most of the notes in my mind map, so go ahead and check it out. The link will be in the description. And that is it. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Not only will it give me ideas on what I can cover next, but it helps tremendously with the YouTube algorithm. Make sure you like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next next video.